editor of Chromix magazine, um, runs a very active group in New York, uh, also CEO of Advanced Neurobiosciences, and I guess a new organization, Biostasis Technologies, which I have to ask you about. Yeah. Um, also, author of the first comprehensive Chromix procedure manual, which is actually online. If you really want to get your hands dirty with the details of how Chromix works, uh, that's what you can look at that. Also, the current preservation protocol for alcohol. So, uh, Ashwin's done tremendous work in setting the protocols and in educating people. Please welcome Ashwin de Wolf. All right. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to uh, to be here. I, I was just thinking, I was here, like, well, not here, but um, Elbor had a conference uh, 20 years ago in 2002. I think it was called the Fifth Ang Elbor Conference on Extreme Life Extension. And I was not a member yet then because I wanted to sort of check it out to see if like, the people were credible, and they were. And I signed up also because they waived. <laughs> the application fee if you would sign up at a conference. And there were a lot of good speakers there. There was, you know, was Steve Harris, I think Brian White was speaking there. I think Greg was there as well. Uh, it was were good panels. There was a presentation by uh, Robert Freitas, and he is not generally very prone to public speaking. So it was actually a very unique event, and I recall very vividly his, uh, his presentation was, uh, was called uh, Death is an Outrage with an Exclamation Mark. <laughs> that was one of his first sort of like introductions to the, uh, the concept of nanomedicine at, uh, at an Elbor conference. Um, so, uh, Greg was earlier saying that, uh, you know, taking on the, uh, the Coles case as a research case was, was, was probably one of the best sort of allocations of research funding, and that's hard to dispute. But I think one good, you know, contender, at least for second place, is this new massive book by uh, Robert Freitas called Cryostasis Revival. This is the first comprehensive, detailed, technical book how we're going to revive chronic patients. So, um, so all the sort of questions you have, like sort of what kind of damage uh, can still be corrected? What can we infer from the damaged state? Um, what do we do at certain temperatures? It's kind of all there. And, one of the strengths of the book is that it does not just outline one specific repair scenario, it goes through a number of them. And there's even actually a repair scenario for LDI stabilized uh, prior preservation for biological revival, because right now when people talk about the technology, most of talk about mitop loading. But theoretically, you can believe in the former and be skeptical about the latter. So there's a lot of good things in this book. I very strongly uh, recommend it. I, I think some of you know kind of how it originated. I, uh, I, I, was, I was kind of frustrated for a while that there was no paper at all at, at, at the concept of uh, cryobots, like uh, nanobots that can operate at cryogenic temperatures. So in, in all my modesty, I, uh, I contacted Robert and asked him if he would be interested in the paper, you know, a modest paper about that topic. He thought he would certainly be the best person to write. And so I've kind of he brushed me off a little, and I, kept, I, I was I, I was pretty persistent. I, I kept bringing it up, and at some point I'm like, I'm, I'm really starting to annoy this guy. <laughs> and, uh, and and then he said, like, no, no, actually, I really admire your persistence. And so how this is how this came about. And um, so he got to work, and at some point his paper was 40 pages. And I think he got very ambitious about the whole idea. Of revival of chronic patients. So then it was 200, then it was 400, 600, and at some point I was, uh, you know, he sent me a manuscript of between 800 and 900 pages, and almost everything is in this book right now. So I really strongly recommend it. I don't think you can make very credible technical objections to chronic with at least having engaged with this book. It has a great forward by the famous uh, Dr. Greg Fay as well, which uh, you should also check out. And I think in the next couple of days, uh, the new issue of Grimes Magazine will come out, and it's mostly devoted to Robert Freitas and his work. There is a more succinct exposition of the theory of his book. Uh, there is also a very nice profile about him as a scholar, but also about you know, how he grew up and all things. And um, there's not a lot of information so far on that, so I mean, check that out. 
And yeah, please get the book. Uh, I think it's really great. It's uh, it's not easy to travel with. It's heavy. I already feel it after having it in my hands for a couple of minutes. Um, it is available over there. Um, it's also available on Amazon. But if you want to support Aeroport, you can get it here. And uh, there are not a whole lot of many copies. Uh, they're not cheap, and that's because it's a hard cover. It has a lot of high quality color reproductions. So. I really recommend it. I think it's one of the most important publication events in history of our field. And I'm very proud to have been part of making that happen. All right. So, um, today I'm going to talk about this new organization, this new nonprofit that we have incorporated named Biosafes Technologies. And um, I cannot tell you a whole lot yet about its operation, what we've done, because it's also brand new. So most of my presentation will go into why, what are we going to do, why is it important. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a, uh, a quote of my Darwin, former Elgor president, very prolific researcher and uh, writer about chronics, and he said, one of the most difficult and dangerous aspects of chronics has been the absence of feedback. If you enter a hospital or surgery, take your car for repair, or contract for the addition of your room to your home, you will have little doubt as to the quality of work or the desirability of the outcome. And he wrote this sort of in response to sort of arguments that people make, like, oh, you know, as long as we get sort of people into do war um, and we're sort of optimistic about nanotechnology, we're, we're kind of fine. But that is not very persuasive to a lot of people. But Chronix has this problem that it's very hard to say if we do a case, like, well, is this a really good case? Um, if you go like to the doctor with a broken leg or whatever, you know exactly what to sort of look for when you come out. You know, if you have a burning wound, you know what you want. And Chronix has this problem of feedback. Now, I would say it's more of a qualified problem because it's not that we don't have feedback, but you really need to know what you're looking for because um, sort of the, the ultimate validation of Quranics would be a revival, but we know in a situation that until that point we cannot say anything meaningful. And I, I think uh, you know, Dr. Fay has talked a lot about sort of the, uh, the research case of course, like how much sort of information can extract, and that you know then we can sort of calibrate our optimism or pessimism about that. But we cannot look at specific cases, like how they compare. So, like, here's an example, and this is a pretty famous one. Uh, I, I think many people over in this field know this. This is an example of Quranic feedback. This is data collected in cooling. And you see a number of different cooling methods. So, like, one is just, like, covering the patient with ice bath. The other one is, like, placing in the ice bath. And the third one is called squid, in which you just rapidly circulate ice-cold water. And we're doing that, of course, to rapidly you know, reduce metabolism after pronouncement of legal death. So this is sort of a very sort of example of, of data we can collect and then compare. And a lot of more like this would would be preferable. Here's an interesting one. I think I once showed it in, in Europe during a, a presentation when I worked at Suspended Animation. Actually, we, um, we tested just a cooling box and then we looked at different kinds of insulation or no insulation at all and then we looked at how long it took for all the water ice to, uh, to melt. And that's kind of pretty important because as soon as you put a patient in an out-of-state case in, uh, uh, in a container with ice, you want to make sure that upon arrival the patient is still around zero degrees steep. So we looked at that and this is really interesting because this is a sort of very basic logistical part of cryonics, but if you, you mess this up and the patient really warms up a lot, you have a lot more postmortem ischemia. So that, that is a good example. Now we, we, we take it a little further. So one thing that people always like is the sort of a very simple score. And you know, it's very hard to just score a cryonics case, like okay. Uh, is it a five or a six or a seven? But one thing we can do is actually is quantify the duration of ischemia, the postmortem interval without any metabolic support. And Mike Perry and I um, created a measure called the SMIX, which stands for Standardized Measure of Ischemic Exposure. That's quite the mouthful, so let's call it SMIX then. And it expresses total ischemic exposure in a case uh, as the equivalent of normothermic ischemia. So we do our all procedures, we do the cooling, and then at some point we can say like, okay, 
Uh, it took an X amount of time, but there was metabolic support during these stages, the cooling was, and then we can generate the equivalent time of normal firm ischemia. Now clearly the perfect score is zero. That is probably not achievable in chronics unless you would have some kind of elective hospital-based procedures in which, you know, uh, cardiac arrest itself would be induced by hypothermia and having ventilations and so forth. But it's good to have this sort of kind of benchmark. This was published a couple of years ago in Cranix magazine. You can also like go for it as makes and my last name and my carry and they can read about a lot of the theory about it. Um, so here you see sort of the ischemic, so this is part of uh, the Alcor meta-analysis project. I and mean, some of you may probably know what this is. It is basically a very uh, prolonged systemic effort to collect all the data of Alcor's cases, put them in a database, organize them, look for correlations, look at what, what is typical, what is average, what is immediate. So what you see here is the typical ischemic exposure of a chronic patient, the median for a year. And we do medium instead of average because you might have a very strange case that is completely beyond Alcor's control that really increases that, that value a lot. Let's say there's a lot of resistance from the family and whatever. And Alcor had actually once had a case where they had to basically force you know, the, the family to, and they, they prevailed to, but that patient had to be for the exhumed and <laughs> then preserved, and, you know. Um, so, but look, look at this medium score. So, I took a close myself a little. So, uh, four, 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 six, there's a 15, seven. So, that, that's sort of not trivial. That, that is a non trivial amount of normal firm ischemia. Um, and the other thing that you see, it's like, it's not like getting better and better and better. It's more so like up and down and up and down and up and down. And I will get to that point because that is really sort of one of the premises that recognition of this phenomenon that was one of the contributing factors in creating this organization. Um, talking about the SMIX, um, uh, when I heard Greg talk about the Coles case, I was just actually wondering, um, like, what, what, where does he end up? Like, uh, what, what was the calculation for him? So I looked it up actually on my phone. I, I, went into the uh, you know, meta-analysis database and he had uh, 1.4, that's one hour and 40 minutes. That is a very good outcome for a typical chronic case. That's probably up in the best six or seven uh, outdoor cases sort of ever. So I, I think it should not be a surprise to see the sort of outcomes in, the, in, in terms of like elimination of ice formation and, and, and so forth. Unfortunately, as you can see here, uh, not, not all cases are that great, and um, this has consequences. So, um, one of the things we did in the meta-analysis project, and we have to like quantify this a little better, and this is very preliminary, is look at the CT scans that Alcor has done of the brain, and then sort of, on a scale from one to five, um, look at how much ice formation we could see. And, and the ice formation shows as either very sort of low, very low concentrations of the crack protectant or just things that look clearly straight frozen. And um, zero is the best. We chose zero because, well, that's kind of intuitive, no, no ice formation. And if you look, then um, we, we don't have any case there. There might be one case that might actually can be moved into the zero and we'll get to this after this slide, but we try to be just very conservative. But as you can see, um, uh, there's a lot of it in the middle. Uh, of course, there's quite a bit of straight freeze as well, but there's a non-trivial amount where almost most of the brain had suboptimal uh, concentrations of the uh, crowd protectant. So this is a CT scan of patient A. That's a very low A number, so if you're in the upper memory, you're going to A number. It's a very low A number. This is a Fred Chamberlain case. Most people are, I think, aware of this uh, case because it had a really good uh, outcome in terms of CT scans. Um, it's, I think, a matter of, of opinion whether you say this was an ice cream prior preservation or not. Some people have claimed it. Uh, yeah. um, we, we, Based on looking at it very carefully, we didn't classify it as such because it's pretty, pretty darn close. Interestingly enough, 
it was uh, an S mix that is almost identical to the Steve Cole's case. So that's very, very interesting. Um, there's one other thing that uh, may stand out to you in uh, this image, in this CT scan. Does, does anyone like see something um, that has been talked about before? Brain. Yes, so it is a very shrunken brain, and that is not atypical in cases with this little uh, ischemia. Um, in, in animal models, maybe with the exception of the dog, we see very significant CPA-induced shrinking of the brain, uh, you know, up to like 50% or so. And I wanted to briefly say one thing about this. Um, one thing that we, we have done in our lab, Advanced Neurobiosciences, with the support of like a Blue Phoenix in the funding, we looked at whether we can recover hippocampal slice viability after loading and unloading the cry protected. In this case, this was V1. And um, because I was very intrigued, because apparently Europe Tuban was able actually to recover quite a bit of viability. And, uh, you know, that, that was, that was surprising because good ultrastructure is one thing, but recovering viability in slices after loading and unloading with the crack protectant is quite another. So we started out with it, and we started out without any kind of blood brain barrier modification, and our viability was pretty much zero. But when we started opening the blood brain barrier, and it took a lot of iteration of protocols, like you know when to administer, how much, what is the total exposure time uh, to the highest concentration? We, we, it started to start really creeping up. And uh, so we got some pretty good viability out of it. Not as good as, as you would find in sort of the isolated hippocampal slice work, but, you know, non-trivial, like, you know, up above, you know, 60%. And usually in your best slice work, you're in the, up in the high 80s with hippocampal slices. So that was a very sort of corroborating, strong argument in favor of uh, opening the blood-brain barrier. So I wanted just to mention that before we continue. Um, so here's an example uh, of a CT scan where things are not so great. Um, it was an unattended cardiac arrest room temperature case. That's never very good. There was no cardiopulmonary support at all, no chest compressions, no ventilations. This S mix was 12 hours, uh, 72. Um, as you can see, I mean, you don't have to like be an expert on CT scans. You can sort of see the color codes, and um, the more you get sort of in the red zone, let alone the blue, these are just very low concentration of cryo protectant, or just simply, you know, straight frozen. And there was cryo protection here, so uh, cryo protection in the ischemic brain with very long amounts of uh, both more metabolic metabolic support can still lead to extensive ice formation. So, and there's a strong correlation between the S mix, like the duration of ischemia, and how much ice you see. There's actually one very interesting exception we found in that, and I talked, uh, you know, for the European Biostasis Foundation about this case, where a patient had a pretty long S mix. Um, it was like something like six or seven, and had a pretty good outcome in terms of cryoprotected concentrations and ice formation. And um, it turned out, when I started digging into this case, that was a pre mortem administration of heparin. Sometimes we can persuade the hospital to do administration of heparin. So that's, I think, the really interesting take home message of that. So there's more to it than just the duration of uh, ischemia. So let's talk about the reality of SST. SST stands for standby stabilization and transport of a chronic patient. Um, the number of, like, the percentage of local cases is actually relatively low. And as most of you um, who have studied chronics for a little bit probably know, like, local cases, generally speaking, if there is a sort of prolonged agonal phase and we can deploy, are just much better because we can really. Uh, reduce the ischemic time, and um, all procedures will happen in the Elbers operating room where we have a lot more control and know how of how to do things. And look at cardiopulmonary supports, so the chest compression, usually mechanical chest compressions and ventilations. And in the meta-analysis project, we defined um, 
cardiopulmonary support as chest compressions and ventilations. It's not just about accelerating cooling, it's also really supporting the brain by oxygenating it. Um, and the, it's, it's only a minority, it's a large minority, but the majority of people don't get full cardiopulmonary support. And this should really give us some pause because um, my, my, my parent and I, we did a calculation how fast do you need to cool if you would only do cooling, no neuroprotectants, no ventilations, to outrun ischemia, and it would be more than two degrees Celsius per minute, which is, it's, it's really, that cannot be done you know, by today's current technologies. Even like one degree a minute would be really pushing it, and you would need something like extracorporeal uh, support for that internal cooling. So the reality is that a lot of people do not get the kind of meta metabolic support to the brain that we would like to see, which translates in all this ischemia, which translates in suboptimal perfusion. So here's some other sort of early lessons from the Alcor meta-analysis project. Case outcomes appear random. What I mean by that is that um, if we look at these kind of metrics, it's like every year things are getting better. No, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, calculated equivalent normal thermic exposure is, is a lot more than an hour, way more than an hour. Uh, there's ice formation in, in, in brains that have been treated with vitrification solution. That is more the rule than uh, the exception. There is a correlation between ischemia and ice formation. The majority of chronic cases are not local, and cases with full CPS are a minority. So it's kind of a very simple illustration. So like, I, I, I think Greg was like overly modest about, you know, the evidence supporting chronics. I mean, in the beginning we had, you know, straight freeze or very low concentration of glycerol and then mostly due to his work we can have ice-free cryopreservation. But in the beginning was still a lot of toxicity and he brought that down as well. So we're increasingly coming to a point where we get very, very close to preserving people in a way that is indistinguishable from, uh, from controls. The Eldite stabilized cryopreservation work, patient work, I remember uh, Robert McIntyre was here and I actually have asked people like, what is the control, what is the experimental uh, procedure just based on looking at these micrographs and people, you know, could not figure it out. This is identical. So that's great. And there's a lot of new technologies we've introduced, but in the fields, unfortunately, it, it's not like translated like that. So we see a lot more of an erratic pattern. We, we would like to see this orange part also just at least go in parallel and go up. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why uh, many of the ceramics cases are not too great is a lot of what we do is based on the blind fly model. So we basically have a standby team, let's say in Arizona or in California, and then there is a case in Chicago, and then so we have to fly out and, and sit by the patient bedside. And, and so people say like, well, but either you know you have a sudden, sudden, sudden death and it goes really quickly, and no one can be really on time, and it might be an autopsy, or the patient has this kind of prolonged agonal period, and then we can fly there and we are in time. But there are actually quite a few cases in which. Uh, okay, the patient goes on a much more rapid decline, and um, and then you know the team is late. So that leads to the late response in case of sudden death, the later response in case of rapid decline. Uh, there can be compromised response in case of travel limitations. The brain certainly is no longer viable by biological criteria if we only do a washout and ship it back to Alcor, so, and that can you know lead to compromised ultrastructure, perfusion, and ice formation. So how to improve things? Well, we can like set standards for ground case work, start comprehensive SST research, have a full-time QT, QA officer hiring, EMF personnel with proper, proper qualifications, motivation, great local capabilities, and field prior protection, talk about that. Let's talk about like uh, a full-time quality control, quality assurance position. I mean, attempts have been made in the past uh, by Alcor to create that, and it, so far it has not worked yet, but I think it's, it would be very valuable that person would be full-time focusing on cases, uh, you know, uh, looking at post-case debriefings, helping shaping, like analyzing case reports, and to identify reasons and benchmarks, you know, to, to get different outcomes, 
design and implement policies and make sure that these policies are implemented. Um, field crab protection, I think, is sort of a, a, a real paradigm change instead of tolerating a lot of this uh, uh, old ischemia patient needs to be shipped to the Elko facility. We do everything in the field. Um, the crab protection can be done on location or in a vehicle. Um, so the old schema during airports is eliminated and you only have to do sort of one employment instead of two. And uh, all body field crab protection used to be sort of like seen as very, very challenging, but uh, like I think we're getting there. Uh, tomorrow, Bystasis in Europe uh, is pulling it off, prototyped it, have designed it. Uh, you see actually you know, uh, that is a photo of their circuit on their portable ice bath. And I, I think if we could universally do that in, in many cases, we can move a lot more of these cases to much lower SMIX and much better crowd protection. So you could do a failure analysis, like you have a case benchmark. So what you, let, let's say, say as an organization, like we don't want no unattended death, we want no SST delays, uh, we want an SMIX uh, less than an hour, and we know ice formation is CT scan. Now, of course, we know that it's kind of really hard to do. But you can every time apply this benchmark to a specific case and say, why did we fall short? Is this something, is this a recurring pattern? How do we improve? So this is why a number of us came together and we sort of recognized, like especially current organizations like Elkhorn and Kranich Institute right now, they are sometimes just moving from one case to another. And it, it, there's sometimes just not the time to really sit down and have several people completely 100% focused on, um, on researching these issues, setting standards, doing all this quality control, and, um, and that will be sort of the, one of our aims for this organization. And then there might also be new SST local organizations that we would sort of support and we help people like creating those in, in, in their area. Um, okay, so right now um, we have incorporated the Biostasis Technologies is headquartered in New York City. It's a nonprofit. It's run by people with very extensive chronic experience. Uh, we will have a clerical, clinical and biomedical staff. There will be distributed research and development. I mean, a lot of it's part of the larger sort of chronic research network so we can draw upon a variety of labs and entities to do research or we do it ourselves. My own company, for example, Advanced Neurobiosciences, can uh, do some stuff as well. Um, in collaboration, of course, with existing crisis, because we're really there to serve organizations. We're not offering any standby ourselves or do anything like that. It is really an assisting role. So what are these advantages to uh, chronic organizations? Well, uh, the development of standards for chronic procedures, not something we really sort of want to impose. We sort of want to work with the chronic organization. Some chronic organizations do things differently than others, but I think it is possible to say Given that you do this, this is probably like a really reasonable like thing to shoot for. Uh, Full-time case review analysis, again, it's like, you know, we, we can sort of assist in that. Organization chronic case data meta-analysis, you know, it's, it's in our hope and we probably will be offered that to existing chronic organizations to continue sort of the meta-analysis project, continue building the database. Uh, scientific and clinical advice, uh, education and training would be a really interesting thing we like to do, and uh, also the assistance, uh, assistance integration of Kranix capabilities. Um, some of us went through that a little bit with uh, European people because they're relatively new and it has been very sort of helpful to have a structured uh, conversation about this, but now with this entity that we, we can further sort of formalize that. Um, okay, so I'm going to end with uh, some of the research topics that uh, we will be having. Uh, one will be, and I'm pretty excited about that, is a completely comprehensive review of chronic procedures because some of them are supported like by really strong evidence. Like for example, the, the Agent M22. I mean, it, it's it's backed by peer review uh, journals. Uh, there will be even a brain paper coming out that applied M22. But there are other parts of our procedures where the evidence, I would say, is mixed. And there are others like we don't know a whole lot about actually like what exactly goes on for hours during cardiopulmonary support. Well, not really. Uh, monitoring of chronic procedures is going to be very important. There are a lot of different ways in which we can infer if a chronic case is on the right track when it's going on. And we sort of want to develop that and you know in collaboration with existing organizations see 
you know, if it's realistic, if we can implement it, and then further use of feedback of that. Uh, quantification of outcome procedures, probably has been a really good example. Uh, we created a, a calculator on uh, our website, which is still like under construction right now, but uh, people don't have to go through all the math of that. You can just, you know, enter what you know about temperature and uh, exposure time, and then it, it just spits out an estimate's value. Um, one thing we're actually interested in is professionalization of vitrification. There are several cases in which there's almost no funding and the brain is the only thing that can be preserved and it's immersed in fixative and then later it's like crack protected and uh, if it is done in the right circumstances that might be a reasonable procedure for a subset of circumstances but it's very ad hoc there is no systematic like research program for that so there's one thing we want to do and we certainly want to further keep working out whole body field crack protection um, I can no longer say we want to introduce that because that's fortunately going to happen soon or you know when they're ready uh, in, in Europe. But there's still a lot that can be done. Also, there's a really difference whether you do it, let's say, an agent with uh, FEM1, which is relatively inexpensive, or in 22 is an expensive agent. So there's a lot of questions to ask. So these are some of the research topics, and we're very enthusiastic about it. I think we're still sort of building these organization in the background. But starting sort of next year, we, we will staff it with at least four or five people. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, our email address is functional. It's you know contact at Biostasis Technologies or or you can just you know talk to me or some of the other people involved. I want to thank uh, some entities that either have been instrumental in making this happen or have contributed to some of the uh, research results that are presented. This is the Biomedical Research and Longevity Society, BRS, or Sol and Bill, as some people would like to call it, but hopefully it will go on a lot longer. Elcor, of course, congratulations again with uh, the 50th anniversary. Blue Phoenix, relatively neochronics R&D company that uh, has supported us with some of the research and the European Biostasis Foundation that actually made me very confident that this could be a very sort of fruitful way to collaborate with existing chronic organizations to like further improve things because we want to really be at your service. We have nothing to compete for. We just want to make things better. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Hello, Ashwin. I noticed on the chart showing the ischemic damage exposure time, the highest was the year 1993. And I wondered if you could explain why that was, that that particular year had the highest exposures. Um, yeah, I think I kind of looked into that. I think it's probably a year where there were very few cases. And the, one, and the one that was there that year was a really bad case. It was probably someone was, you know, found dead, you know, in his, his or her home, like after two or three days, uh, and then you, you get that. And then even if you have one or two relatively good cases, you know, that, that doesn't improve sort of the medium outcome for that by a whole lot. So that was probably an unfortunate year with few, few cases and a few kind of that were like really bad. Patents on what? Look, if we find something that is very applicable to mainstream medicine, we might think about it because then we can channel that money back to the chronics community. But overall, we're willing to share it with every chronics organization that we think is credible. Welcome to the network as well, so I'm going to